In southeastern Missouri lies an area of approximately 1,700 square miles that, owing to its appearance and relationship to the rest of the state, is called the Missouri Boot Heel. Although, locally, the term refers to an entire area of Mississippi River lowlands rather than just that part of the state that drops below the state's southern border. The population density in the Boot Heel is light, only some 36 people per square mile, a little more than a third of the national average, and the counties of the Boot Heel are among Missouri's most impoverished. But its history is rich, as is its soil. Owing to a little-known project that has been described as one of the greatest engineering projects in U.S. history. In its time, the largest drainage project in the world, the Little River Drainage District, moved more earth than the digging of the Panama Canal. It is history that deserves to be remembered. 150 years ago, the continental United States was a much wetter place. According to a 1990 report to Congress by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, in the time of colonial America, the area encompassing what is today the Lower 48 included some 221 million acres of wetlands. But over a period of 200 years, the Lower 48 states lost an estimated 53% of their original wetlands. On average, this means that the Lower 48 states have lost over 60 acres of wetlands for every hour between the 1780s and the 1980s. While there is more appreciation today for the value of wetlands to ecology, that sentiment was not always recognized. As a 2016 article in the Journal of Soil and Water Conservation noted, more than a century ago, American swamps and river lowlands were considered wasteland of no value and a hindrance to land development. The issues were not just seen in economic terms, but human ones. A 1935 report by the Land Planning Committee to the National Resources Board concluded that about 91 million acres of swamp and overflowed land in the United States could be reclaimed by drainage and thus could support 40 million people. By their very nature, wetlands, although largely unavailable for farming, tend to contain very rich soil. By reclaiming wetlands, people would not just be transforming land that was seen as unproductive, but would be allowing the use of farmland that would be particularly productive. The value of these lands increased with both westward population expansion and technological developments in farming. The first half of the 19th century included developments in implements such as plows, rakes, and mechanical reapers that allowed settlers to break ground in areas not previously considered for farming. More innovation in industrial tools for farming such as mechanical cedars, harrowers, binders, and threshers would continue the trend into the 20th century. As railroads brought access to new lands, the American frontier dwindled, bringing more and more focus on maximizing the productivity of the lands of the heartland. A 2016 article in the Journal of Soil and Water Conservation noted, By the 1890 census, it was clear that the United States no longer had a frontier, and American wetlands became the next area of interest for settlement and cultivation. Moreover, wetlands were seen as barriers to settlement and breeding places for mosquitoes and the diseases they carry, and wetland management was seen as critical in controlling floods. The federal government, simply put, recognized the value of draining the nation's swamps, which, coincidentally, were on land mostly owned, by the federal government. The decrease in wetlands, a trend that had occurred since the earliest European settlement, thus got a particular boost with the Federal Swamplands Acts. The Federal Swampland Acts began with a bill in 1848 to authorize the drainage of the Everglades in the state of Florida. That act would be followed by one in 1849, specific to the state of Louisiana, and the further acts in 1850 and 1860, extending to other states. The acts provided a method for identifying wetlands that were unfit for cultivation and transferred such lands to the federal states in exchange for a promise to drain the land, or at least make it economically productive. The website Cultural History of the United States explains, In the context of the 19th century, the Swampland Acts made a lot of sense for the federal government as much as for the states, as vast areas of land went unused due to swamps and other natural waters. At this point, the U.S. was still a relatively young country, trying to build a nation and attract settlers to push through that last frontier. Land grants and citizenship were used as incentives, and the removal of geographical obstacles such as swamps and lakes helped expand the fledgling republic. The Swamplands Acts affected many U.S. states, and notably the Florida Everglades, but one area that was significantly affected was that part of southeastern Missouri that is called the Boot Heel. When Missouri first petitioned for statehood in 1818, the proposed southern border was to be the parallel 30 degrees 30 north latitude an extension of the parallel that formed the border between the neighboring states of Kentucky and Tennessee. But before the state was admitted to the Union in 1821, the southern boundary was changed to include an area that dropped the southern border approximately 50 miles to the 36th parallel between the Mississippi and St. Francis Rivers, 
adding 627,000 acres at the expanse of Arkansas and creating the distinctive Missouri Boot Heel. There are many anecdotal explanations for the change, including one claim that a sympathetic surveyor was attempting to protect a widow who was unaware that she lived 45 miles south of the Missouri border. A popular explanation is that keeping the boot heel in Missouri was the result of the political pull of one John Hardman Walker, who had purchased large parcels of land in the area following the 1811-12 New Madrid earthquakes. While the decision was likely the result of multiple factors, one compelling argument was that the area was more defined by the Mississippi River culture and economy of St. Louis than it was by Arkansas. Then, as today, the area called the Boot Heel was defined by its rivers. While the rivers played a major role in trade, they also defined the nature of the land. The area between the Mississippi and the St. Francis River was part of the Mississippi floodplain, making the land flat, and deposits of silt from centuries of flooding made the soil particularly rich. But this land was virtually inaccessible to agriculture, and instead was a cypress swamp. In fact, instead of Southeast Missouri, the area is often locally called Swamp East Missouri. A 1993 edition of the Southeast Missourian notes the marshlands then constituted one of the largest swamps in the American interior often called Dark Cypress, the Big Swamp, or the Great Swamp, the area in the floodplain south of Benton in southeast Missouri was all but uninhabited by humans until early in the 20th century. All kinds of wildlife, including bears, abounded. A 2008 report on the KFVS 12 News from Cape Girardeau, Missouri, quoted bootheel farmer Rosemary Lumson. My Uncle John came in 1880. What he found was the area's few residents living afloat. The flooded land was good for commercial hunting. When the reporter asked how much of this land would be farmable if the land were not drained, Lumsden replied, None of it. It would be a swamp. The Journal of Soil and Water Conservation noted, Because of the swampy conditions, less than 15% of the land was suitable for cultivated agriculture. But the 1850 Swamp Lands Act had sold those wetlands to the state of Missouri, which had sold it to its counties, which had sold it to private companies. While much of the bottomland was not yet habitable, it did abound in trees, hardwoods such as oak, locust, and willows of immense size. The Journal of Soil and Water Conservation mentions that the bottomlands included oak trees with a circumference as large as 27 feet. The first to exploit the land after the Swamplands Act was expanded to Missouri, where railroad and timber companies, buying land for as little as 75 cents an acre and harvesting bottomland timber. The lumbering did involve building drainage ditches and roads, but as the timber that was reachable dwindled, the land was no longer productive. That not only left these landowners with substantial tax burdens for lands that were now unproductive, but the requirements of the Swamp Lands Acts was that the land be made to be productive. The journal continues, by 1910, land purchased by timber and railroad companies was deemed wasteland again, and only tree stumps and water remained. Lumber companies were left paying taxes on thousands of hectares of cleared swamp land and didn't know what to do with it. Missouri passed a drainage district law in 1899 that facilitated tax assessment and the creation of tax-funded drainage districts. In 1905, a collective of lumber and railroad companies met to lay the groundwork for what would become the world's largest drainage project. The petition to the state to create the district was the longest petition ever filed at the time in a Missouri civil proceeding. The petition was opposed by some of the railroads, who as the largest landowners in the area would have borne the brunt of the tax burden. The case went all the way to the United States Supreme Court, which affirmed the state's right to create the district. The Little River Drainage District was formed in 1907. Plans were finalized by the end of 1909 and work began in 1913. A 1999 edition of the Southeast Missouri and opined, the boot heel was loaded with valuable hardwoods and some of the richest agricultural land to be found. But the swamps prevented harvesting of the bulk of the timber and allowed only limited farming during the dry seasons. It was inevitable that the swamps be drained. The idea was not new. The Journal of Soil and Water Conservation wrote plans to turn the 800,000 hectares of swampland into farmland dated back to the 1840s, but the task was too big for individual farmers to undertake. Not even the federal government, which owned the swamplands at the time, had ever undertaken a project of that magnitude. But in 1904, the United States had taken on the great project of the Panama Canal, and developments in engineering expertise and earth-moving equipment made what was once impossible, possible and the vision of the drainage district convinced people to invest through bonds and convinced landowners to pay for the project via taxation. Despite the size of the Great Swamp, a drainage project for Swamp East Missouri had an advantage. The land slopes, as KFVS 12 noted in its report, from Cape Girardeau to the Arkansas-Missouri state line, there's a 100-foot drop in elevation. 
100 miles in distance, so you got one foot per mile. Doesn't seem like much, but that's enough. The project was massive. The Southeast Missourian explains the project required the expertise of some of the best engineering minds in the nation. It involved construction of 957.8 miles of ditches and 304.43 miles of levees. The project consisted of two parts, a project to diverse headwaters from hill country in the north via a diversion channel, and a system of five parallel ditches in the south that provided local drainage for approximately 975 square miles. The Southeast Missourian continues, Transforming the Big Swamp was Herculean work that required mosquito-repellent men, steam-powered slump pullers and dredges, and about 20 years. KFVS-12 described the working conditions. Houseboats were home to many of the men and women who dug 950 miles of drainage canals and built 300 miles of levees. As the project was nearing its conclusion, disaster struck in the form of the 1927 Great Mississippi Flood, which damaged the work done and resulted in the involvement of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, tasked after the flood with taming the Mississippi with flood control. The Sykeston, Missouri Standard Democrat wrote, Through World War I, disease outbreaks, 24-hour work schedules, floods and equipment disasters, and even the Great Mississippi River Flood of 1927, work continued until it was finished in 1928. The Missouri State Archives note that the Little River Drainage District was constructed between 1914 and 1928. It covers 540,000 acres and drains a total of 1.2 million acres. It was the world's largest drainage project and by its completion had moved more earth than the construction of the Panama Canal. The project cost a total of $11.1 million, all paid for by taxes on the landowners. The result was economic transformation. As the Southeast Missourian explains, though it took many more years to clear the land for farming and the Depression nearly forced bankruptcy, the Little River Drainage District eventually was a boon to southeastern Missouri. Cotton and later corn, soybeans, watermelon, potatoes, and other crops became the mainstays of the economy. Ancillary businesses also blossomed. KFES 12 notes the importance of the project to southeast Missouri. Many of the things we have here would not be here if not for agriculture. Without the flood control and drainage that our district and other districts provide, we wouldn't have our agriculture. You can't grow cotton, corn, and soybeans in standing water. By any standard, the Little River Drainage District was an astounding feat of engineering, although it's almost unknown in the United States and even little known in the boot heel, where many people today don't seem to realize that this relatively small area of land that today produces fully one third of the agricultural output of the entire state of Missouri was until relatively recently, well, a swamp. According to the Army Corps of Engineers, some 31.5 million gallons of water pass through the district's drainage system every year, and the LRDD operates today on a budget of about a million dollars a year to maintain the levees and ditches, paid for by a tax on the landholders of about three dollars an acre, an amount that one farmer told KFVS was a bargain. The land is extremely productive. The website Farm Flavor quotes Mike Martin of Martin Rice Company. This is the right area and the right soil type for just about any crop. It's unique to the state because it's part of the old Mississippi River Delta. We've got rich soil and plentiful irrigation and it makes it ideal for rice, soybeans, cotton, and really most anything people want to farm here. The seven counties of the district lead the state in production of soybeans, rice, and cotton. But agricultural productivity has not necessarily resulted in wealth for the people of the district's seven counties, which are among the most impoverished in the state of Missouri. A problem that is only exacerbated in recent years as the average size of the farms has increased and more and more of the labor has become mechanized. And the nation has come to understand the value of wetlands that were once derided and drained. Wetlands provide value as wildlife habitat in protecting and improving water quality, maintaining groundwater levels, and ironically, as they have often been drained in the name of flood prevention, in storing flood waters. Even as the LRDD was being completed, the United States was passing legislation to protect its remaining wetlands. The 1934 Migratory Bird Hunting and Stamp Act was among the first to start the process of reacquiring American wetlands and restoring them. The LRDD certainly represented an astounding achievement of engineering, but it also represents the challenges of balancing human development and protecting our natural environment. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the History Guide, short snippets of forgotten history, and if you did enjoy, feed the algorithm by making a comment or clicking that like button. 
If you have suggestions for future episodes, please send those to our suggestions email box. Check out our webpage at thehistoryguide.net. And of course, we're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can book a special message from The History Guy on Cameo and check out our merchandise at teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes of Forgotten History, all you need to do is subscribe.